Take All notes right. because everything that is said or shown on the slide is game eligible for the exam. Press the red button. <clears throat> I'm really sorry. I didn't know you guys were going to be tested on this. I would have made it a lot easier. Um, so as you may or may not be aware and may or may not be tested on, Chick-fil-A's are individually owned and operated. Uh, so Chick-fil-A partners with guys like David and Terry, um, who both own and operate the business as a franchise restaurant. Um, and so what that means is that has to be their primary um, and actually only form of active um, employment or income. They can't uh, get another job or collect another uh, paycheck from another organization, they have to both own the business and operate the business, which makes it different than a lot of other franchise restaurants where it may just be a piece or a part of the owner's portfolio and maybe not even something they're actively involved with day to day. Uh, so we're going to talk about Chick-fil-A and kind of about how that uh, whole relationship between the corporate office and the individual owners and operators works. And before I go any farther, just know that because Terry and David are franchise restaurant operators, individual, um, and distinct from Chick-fil-A, that we're going to speak today from our experience and from um, our perspective based on, on you know, my experience as a manager and, and Terry's experience as an owner-operator, but we don't speak for or represent the opinions of the corporate office um, outside of our own personal experience. Is that fair? Good. All right. So this is True at Kathy standing outside of one of his dwarf house restaurants. True at Kathy is the founder of Chick-fil-A and the creator of the chicken sandwich that I'm sure you all know and love. I hope you all know and love. So good. So True from a young age was an entrepreneur. You can see up here in the top uh, left, this is actually True's office um, in the, the home office, the support center in Atlanta, South Atlanta. So you see there, it's you, kind of hard to read, but you see it says Constitution Express right there. That was an Atlanta newspaper, and you see these, these Cokes here. So True grew up in the Techwood Homes area of Atlanta um, during the Great Depression. His mom ran a small boarding house, and True did a lot of things um, from even 8, 9, 10 years old to help support his family um, and help get him through that difficult time. So he sold newspaper subscriptions. And he also sold Cokes to the different construction workers who would work in that area. And from, uh, from the very beginning, Truett was an entrepreneur, and Truett was somebody who understood the value of delivering a remarkable experience to your customers. So very early on, he realized that if he could sell cold Cokes, he could sell them for a higher profit margin because people wanted an ice cold Coca-Cola. And not only could he sell it for a higher profit margin, but he could deliver a better product to his guests. So he made a deal with the guy who delivered ice in his neighborhood. And you're saying, delivered ice? What are you talking about? Well, this is before everybody had an ice maker in their fridge. And there was actually a, a salesman who would go around and deliver blocks of ice to each home so that he could keep things cold. And he made a deal that he could sweep out his, his ice wagon, which was packed in with sawdust for insulation. And any of the ice chips he swept up, he could keep for free. And so then he could ice down his Cokes and sell cold Coca-Cola to his customers. So from the very beginning, Truett was concerned with how he could take better and better care of his customers. In 1946, after World War II, Truett opened the Dwarf Grill restaurant here in Haightville, Georgia. It's just south of Atlanta, across from the Ford Motor Plant. So he was open here in 1946, and it was a counter service restaurant where everything was cooked to order. Um, it had a, a counter with some seats at it and a few small tables, and he would serve mostly shift workers from the Ford plant. So he actually didn't sell chicken for the first uh, for the first 10 or 15 years that he was open because he couldn't cook it fast enough to meet the needs of his customers who were coming in on a quick break. He's going to cook everything to order. Bone-in fried chicken takes a long time to cook. And so he couldn't even serve chicken. And then a friend of his came and said, hey, I've got these boneless, skinless breasts of chicken, um, these pieces. His friend had actually gotten a contract to make meals for airlines, and it had a specific size portion of chicken it needed to go on the airline tray. And he had these other pieces that he didn't know what to do with. And he said, hey, Truett, well, is there anything you can do with this? And so Truett thought back to his mom's boarding house, and he thought back to how she used to take a, a big, heavy metal pan and set it on top of the pot that she fried her chickens in. 
and it would create a sort of pressure cooker. So I started experimenting with different ways um, to cook chicken, to cook these boneless, skinless breasts of chicken. And he finally came up with a way to cook it that was a lot quicker than he could cook a bone-in fried chicken. And then he started breading it and making it into a sandwich. And he tried lots and lots of different combinations. He would add butter to the bun. He added pickles. He would change the spice recipe, getting up to over, over 20 ingredients in our season coder. And finally, after he made all these changes, his customers said, don't change a thing. It's perfect. We like it just the way it is. And so the chicken sandwich was born. And he began to sell it at the Dwarf Grill and at different restaurants and locations all around the country. But again, Trip cared about his customers. And he cared about knowing them individually. And he realized as he was expanding and building, built a second and then a third restaurant, one of them had a fire. And about the same time, Trip got really sick. And he realized as he was kind of recovering from that, that the bigger he got, the harder it was for him as the owner and operator to kind of oversee his product and oversee um, his brand and make sure that it was, uh, that everybody was getting a quality Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich, right? Wasn't even a Chick-fil-A sandwich at that point. And so he decided that, hey, if I'm going to expand, if I'm gonna grow, if I'm gonna try to, to, to expand my business, I'm gonna do things differently than everyone else. And that's where the owner-operator model was born in 1967, right here in the Greenbrier Mall in Atlanta. So this is the first Chick-fil-A location. And from the very beginning, Truett said, hey, we're going to do things differently. We're going to partner with individual owners and operators who don't just own the business. They don't just franchise the rights to sell the product, but they actually operate in the business. They're involved in the business so that they know their customers, they know their team members, and they can be involved in their community. And that's where it all started right there in 1967 with Chick-fil-A. Truett did another interesting thing here with Chick-fil-A. This restaurant was in the Greenbrier Mall. And prior to Chick-fil-A, you didn't have food courts in malls, right? You didn't have what David's got at the Governor's Square Mall with Chick-fil-A. You couldn't go to the mall and while you were doing your shopping, pick up a Chick-fil-A sandwich or a Sabaro pizza or an Annie Ann's pretzel, right? Mall operators, mall owners, thought that having restaurants in the mall would make the, rest or the mall smell, people would leave trash everywhere, and it would just lower the premium experience of shopping in a mall. But Truett saw things differently. He said, hey, if a family comes to the mall and they unload their kids and they all come into the mall and they shop and they get hungry and they have to go back to the parking lot and load up their kids and go somewhere else to eat, chances are you've lost their business for the day. They're not gonna turn around and come back to the mall. If they had more shopping to do, too bad. They're done. Truett said, hey, if they can come here and they can shop and they can eat here in the mall, they're gonna stay longer and they're gonna spend more money with you. And so the Greenbrier Mall let him try it and lo and behold, the food court was born. And then in 1996, we were introduced to the Chick-fil-A cows here, trying to save their hides by encouraging us to eat more chicken. We're here. 1996, with the Richards Group out of Dallas, um, created that campaign alongside of them in 1996. So that's kind of a little bit of an overview of where we came from and kind of our entrepreneurial roots with Truett Cathy and kind of the origins of the owner-operator model. Um, Terry will talk more specifically about that, um, about that model in a moment. Does anybody have any questions about any of the early history of Chick-fil-A? No. Everybody's still awake, so I call that a win. I get an A. I, I, about them, I seem I'll get to them. remember the Tallahassee Mall served, that, that operator served, I don't know if this was uh, with the corporate blessings or not, but they used to, I believe they fried donuts. Yeah. They had a breakfast menu. Yeah, back in the 80s and early 90s, the operators were allowed to do a limited breakfast, and they were allowed to bring their local products in. So some guys are serving ham, biscuits, uh, uh, donuts, home, handmade, homemade yeah. donuts, uh, uh, cheese croissants. And the bigger the brand got, we were required to get on the same page across the chain. So initially it was, it was location to location, it operator was, to operator. It was truly a mom and pop uh, venture. But, to protect the brand and have consistency across the brand, um, they started rolling out a uh, consistent breakfast chain. Menu. Yeah. Yeah. Menu. 
All right. So we've mentioned local ownership of a meaningful brand and kind of how we see that as Chick-fil-A strategic distinctive. And so uh, I'm going to let Terry talk uh, to you guys kind of about his history as a Chick-fil-A operator and kind of how he got involved with Chick-fil-A to begin with. And uh, yeah. Jerry's done a great job, but he's going to make a great operator. Um, I think he's probably going to be an operator in the next, uh, if I had to guess, next few months. I'll be losing him, but it's been a with him for five years. And uh, so I just I want to go over a few things and tell you about local ownership uh, from my perspective. And as Jerry said, everything I say is from my perspective. I do not represent um, Chick-fil-A corporate or the Kathy family in any way, except I represent the brand here locally, okay? So uh, my story, I started out uh, growing up in a little town right up the road here called Cairo. I uh, went to high school there shortly after. Wound up uh, starting, starting college in the Army and then uh, graduated from Georgia State in Atlanta with an accounting degree and uh, started doing accounting work in Atlanta, did it for five years, um, took a CPA, went that route, and I started doing some uh, mini audits, as we call them, for Chick-fil-A corporate on local stores. And my wife at the time was working for Chick-fil-A corporate, and she went on board, and she was a CPA for them. And she asked me, she said, would you consider being a Chick-fil-A operator? I said, I've never done it retail in my life. I've never waited on one customer. I literally grew up working on a farm. Um, everything I did, I, I did piecemeal. In other words, I got paid for how hard I worked. So I had never done retail. And um, I told her, I said, yeah, I'll try it. So one morning, I had breakfast with a vice president from Chick-fil-A, and we ate pancakes for four hours. Uh, literally, four hours. And we had a good talk in Buckhead. Uh, on the north side of Atlanta. And he said, you know, if you really want to do this, he said, I, I advise you, since you've never done retail, you've never worked in a restaurant, he said, I would advise you to go work in a restaurant for about a month right, and see if you really like it or like it. And uh, so I did. I, I, uh, I contacted the guy that opened the first freestander in Chick-fil-A, which is on North Georgia Hills in Atlanta. And uh, the first day I walked in, he shook my hand, we talked, and he handed me the keys to the store. He said, I'll see you tomorrow. And I about fell out. And I said, oh boy. I mean, I've never waited on a customer or anything. And, uh, so he pulled a good one on me, but he, he did work with me a lot after that for about a month. Me and him, he showed me the uh, ropes of the business. We learned. Uh, so what I do with my time? Uh, I think the way, if I was honest, and I'm glad you're here, David. I think if you look at what I do with my time and what David might do with his time in the mall right now, we're at different points in our career. It's probably, probably totally different. I spend about 90% of my time uh, with 10 to 12 people. And those are my key leaders. And right now we have about 260 employees in the two stores. And those directors, leaders, they're required to spend time with everybody under them. But I try to make it to where I can get those 10 or 12 people and I know as much about them as possible. And I know what they need and I take care of those people. It's their job for everybody up under them to take care of those people. So I have to, I have to allocate my time wisely because I also have a family and a life, side, life outside of Chick-fil-A, and it's not always easy uh, keeping the lines I mean, clear. Um, I've always had this saying, and I'm not ashamed of it. I heard an operator say this 20 years ago. He said, I'll let my business fall apart before I'll go my family. And I've tried to do that with my family, my wife and my two boys. I, I try to spend as much time as I can with them, but I have to do that and spend time with these guys also, uh, my leaders. I've got, to, I've got to take care of them the best I can. Um, not always easy. So once you get your own business one day, um, you'll find out that there's going to be things pulling at you. you. You need to keep your priorities in the right order.
time I'm sure you've experienced that with your careers you've had. It's, it's a constant struggle. Uh, life balance. Yeah. Life work balance. And there's a there's a fine line between uh, being balanced at work and personal life and being a workaholic. I mean, a lot of guys run great stores and they have great numbers to back it up. But if you look real closely, their personal life and their family's falling apart. And I would challenge you now, as silly as this may sound to you young guys and gals that don't have family and kids yet, you need to be thinking about that. You know, how am I going to balance that one day? And whatever field you go into, you need to keep that respect. You might want to climb to the top, Kyle, and be the world's you know, best seller and the richest person, but at the same time, if you have a family, don't forget them. Um, you got you to keep things in order. So uh, locally, currently right now, um, I have two stores. I have asked for a third store. Um, I know that it made the paper in the news about the new store coming to Tennessee Street. Um, that store has not been given to me. I have asked for it. Um, we'll see what happens. I, I think the I think they're going to probably make a decision early in 19. And the reason I'm addressing that is because I know some of you were probably going to ask a question about it because it's made the news. And um, nothing is off limits when we start the questions in a minute. You can ask any question you want. I'll answer them to the best of my ability, and I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to lie to you. I'll tell you the good, the bad, the ugly, and uh, everything else for running a restaurant. So, Tom, is there anything else you wanted me to cover? Couldn't have done it better myself. Okay. Is there anything I've missed? Um, the Patty family is the next slide. Yeah, let me go down to that. I wanted you guys to see this. So in the upper right hand corner is Dan Caffey. Uh, he's the current um, head honcho CEO. He's the uh, he's the top guy. He owns uh, the majority of the business right now after Troy passed away. And then we have um, his brother Bubba in the top left hand. Corner, right beside Dan, that's his brother. Um, he owns part of the business. And then the one that's not pictured is Trudy. So there were three kids, Dan, Bubba, and Trudy. And Trudy, um, she is involved in the business, but she's also involved in various organizations that Chick-fil-A sponsors um, that helps. They help, and um, so she's not involved in the deadly operations. Bubba's involved, I think he's still involved with the dwarf houses a little bit. Um, but Dan is he's deeply involved in the business, uh, the Chick-fil-A the Chick-fil-A side of the business. And then you have the grandkids there, they're involved. The guy on the bottom left is Tim Disopolis. He is the guy I had the pancake breakfast with. Uh, probably one of the smartest guys I've ever ever had a chance to talk to. He's he's uh, we call him a genius in Chick-fil-A. The guy is he's done so much for this company. It's pretty amazing what he's accomplished. Over here is our board of directors, or excuse me, what are they calling them here? It's board of directors. That three years ago, we we actually uh, went outside the family, and we actually uh, the company got a board of directors. We had the S Home Depot CEO, the S Walmart CEO on that board. We have a local Atlanta minister on the board there. Uh, we have our CFO there, or our ex-CFO, our ex-marketing um, chief. Um, I reckon you would call him a chief marketing officer. Um, and Dan Bubba's on there. Then we have a local operator. Um, this guy right here is an operator. He's a multi-unit operator. I think he's in North Carolina, right? And his name is, uh, that's Trudy's boy, John. And he's a voice for the operators with the board. He's a very good operator. Um, he, you might think he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was not. He's earned everything he's got, and they treat him just like any other operator. Um, Andrew Cathy up there, who is fourth from the left on the top of the screen, he's Dan's son, and uh, he was a local operator. He ran a store, I think, for five years. Um, he got paid on how the store did, just like we did. No silver spoon. And they asked that all the grandkids, if they're going to work for the corporate office, they have to work in the stores first. Um, 
they didn't make they don't make local operators always do that because about half our guys come from outside and half our guys come from within the company now and um, Jerry would be considered one that's coming from within am I right on that Gary? Yeah. He would be considered an external candidate because he didn't come through the Chick-fil-A corporate ranks, but he does have experience with Chick-fil-A. About half our guys come from the outside, like I did, uh, that have no Chick-fil-A experience. Uh, they come from the military, GM, Ford. They come from all walks of life. I mean, it's just uh, all the board preachers, uh, snap-on tool guys. We've had, you name it. We've had people from all over the world become Chick-fil-A operators. But there's one, I think if, if I had to say, and I was honest with you guys, there's one trait I know they look for. They look for somebody with a proven track record of success. They are looking for somebody that can think on their feet and make decisions uh, and stand by them. And today, the one thing I see that young college graduates struggle with more than anything is, is I like to call it wisdom. Y'all might have another term for it, but you can be extremely smart. You can have a 4.0, graduate cum laude, and get out on your own and still not be able to make a personal local decision and understand why you're making it. And so I, I always encourage, I'm encouraging my two boys now. They're talking about what they're going to do when they get in college, and I said, well, scratch all that. The first thing you're going to do is get a job. You're going to have responsibility while you're going through school. Uh, I've already told them that their social life and their personal life, yeah, I know it's important, but it's not as important as you learning what real responsibility is. So any of you that do not have jobs, I would say it matters when you go start your career one day. They look at that. Get a job and have some, have some type of track record that you can point to and say, this is what I've done with my life. So that's very important. So um, any other questions about local, anything I'm missing? David, Jerry, Tom, anything else you want me to touch on? Okay. So any questions you have about Chick-fil-A, uh, fire away. Yes, sir. So in order to get the rates for Chick-fil-A, uh, like the franchising rates, mm -hmm. do you pay an upfront licensing fee or do you give them like a percentage of your sales? <clears throat> Well, the way the deal works right now, and this is no secret because it's, it's been put out there. I'll tell you how it works. Um, currently, if you get chosen, we call it top grade, like he just got. You're in the system. They pick between 50 and 100 people a year to run stores. Um, you do have a say-so on where you go. They give you a choice of demographic areas. Okay. But you give them $10,000, once you get your store and you start running, you give them 15% of sales, that's your loyalty, and then you split profits 50-50. You might be saying, that's kind of steep. It's, it is steep. Okay. I don't know what McDonald's and Burger King will be in this charge, uh, but I know this is in line. I know this is way below the average. Most franchise fees are six digits and way up. Uh, this is the part right here that is very different. Um, it's because of this right here. Chick-fil-A does not want rich people. They want honest, hardworking people who will go in and make the business successful. So if you come to them with a balance sheet, five, ten million dollars, what's your incentive to be in the business every day? It's not there. You're already successful. Financially, you're set. So why would they take you? Or would they rather take this guy over here? It might not be wealthy, but he's got a great record. Everywhere he's been, he's had success. I mean, if I was Chick fil A, I'd take this person over here, too. So when I went to him 20 years ago, 23 years ago, um, I wasn't wealthy. And I, I did have a track record of working with people, just not retail. 
I worked at UPS in management. I worked as a, I was in the Army, squad leader. Um, and everywhere I've been, I mean, they called my high school football coach, baseball coach, they called my middle school coach. And everywhere they called, I reckon they liked what they heard. So it all worked out. So they do their homework. So this is the arrangement that they have currently. It has not changed, to my knowledge, in the last 51 years. What is the 10000 is, is it a fee? Is it a franchise fee? Yes. Franchise fee. Half the franchise fee, half of the capital. Oh, yeah. Half of it's franchise fee and half of it's working capital. Okay. Do they need that money? No. They have to charge you something to make it legal. Okay. But overall, it's, uh, it, it, you know, you look at it just strictly, from the outside, you know nothing about Chick-fil-A. You say, well, how can you make that work? Buy them. Buy them. Sell them. Like the average Chick-fil-A is coming close to doing double what McDonald's is doing per store. So it works out. Yes, sir. I have uh, two questions. Right. Are we going to see vegan, vegan options soon? Uh, as a franchise owner, let's say you're super into that movement. Do you have the power to do something like that at Chick-fil-A? I'm sure some of the food's vegan, but more vegan options. Can you can you change the menu, I suppose, is my question. The menu is set by corporate. Um, do we have a right if someone comes in and they order a, a salad without chicken? Yes. Yeah, yeah. If they come in and order a wrap without chicken, yes, we have the right to do that. As far as strictly a vegan option, are you talking like tofu or something like that? I don't, I don't exactly. You know, why not? Perfect I example. I anything like that. I mean, I, I really haven't. I mean. Well, everything on the menu is great anyway, so why change yeah, it? I mean, you know, if it was up to me, and I'm speaking just for me, mm -hmm. we'd serve waffle fries, nuggets, and chicken sandwiches. Those are your top three sellers, huh? Well, that's 95% of my business. Gotcha. Um, the menu, com uh, the complexity of the menu is... In my 20 years, it's gotten it's gotten very complex. Okay. It's gotten it's changed a lot, and we try to accommodate people. Chick Fil A tries to stay away from fads. Um, Y'all might not remember seven, eight years ago the low carb fad. Oh, um, uh, true. Hardee's I think came out with a, a low carb burger, and uh, other I watched other restaurants go through this fad. Chick Fil A stayed away from. If, if you have a hero product, as we call it, and it, it's good, and we do independent taste tests on our products before we roll them out, why mess it up? And yeah, I hear you. We rolled out milkshakes. We rolled out various flavored drinks, um, coffee, iced coffee, stuff like that. We've rolled all that out. But I don't see the menu ever leave chicken. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's not chicken. So what was your other question? Yes. Um, so let me make sure I have my facts straight first. This new store on Tennessee is uh -huh. pretty close to yours, right? Yes. How does how does competition work between franchise owners? Uh, what what's what uh, parameters does Chick Fil A give you, as far as competing with someone so close? Well, they don't give you any, but they do take things into consideration. Okay. Their goal is to be fair with local operators, but at the same time, to protect the brand. Yeah. And ensure growth. So let's say I wasn't doing my job. And let's say my stores were not running well. And they wanted, they looked at the traffic counts and they said, that area mandates another store. Uh, I wouldn't blame Chick fil A for putting another store right next to me. I mean, you, you've got to be honest, and you always have to keep this in perspective. It's right here. From your perspective, it might not look like a great deal. Let's say you are you didn't come for money and you weren't born with a silver spoon. And you mean to tell me I'm going to sit in the office and that guy's going to offer me that deal. And when I came along, it was $5,000. And he's got the keys in his hands. And I says, this is what I said to him. I said, you mean to tell me you're going to let me go to Tallahassee? run a store, give you 
I'm going to give you 15% of the sales and we're going to split everything else 50 part. That's right. I said, give me the key. And Tom was the first guy I saw in town. Remember, I bought my house right He sold me my first house. Unreal. Golly, I forgot yeah. that. Sure did. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all perspective. I mean, it, it's an opportunity of a lifetime. So since 20 years ago, my income has gone up tenfold. Congratulations. Tenfold. Is it because I'm some great? 